it's wonderful to be here. Thanks so much, Daniel. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work that we're involved in and thinking about large data sets. Obviously, big data is a real buzzword, but I think there's some really transformational opportunities in large, leveraging large data sets to transform the way that we care for patients. So I'm going to give you one quick example. So this is a line graph of myocardial infarctions at Partners Healthcare System. So heart attacks taking place over, uh, uh, over a decade. And you'll see that the rise, and this is a Q sum, but essentially the case numbers rose and then fell over a five-year period. Now, people don't think to look at this kind of data. It's not the kind of data people focus on. But if you started to drill into this increase, you might have noticed the fact that there was an introduction of a product, as we know, Viox, and then eventually the withdrawal of that, uh, that product. Of course, we didn't know this was taking place in the partner system until well after. And of course, we can't even claim 100% causality. But the reality is that we don't look at the kind of data that's being generated in the course of clinical care for the purposes of actually taking care of our patient populations. And there's a lot of reasons for this, of course. But one of the major reasons, of course, is the data is just not accessible. So in partners, you couldn't necessarily quickly do analysis of MIs at the, at, across the health system. If you look at a comparison to, for instance, the weather, it's very easy. You open up your phone, you see an app, you see the weather, you see forecasts. And that is obviously because of the mass amount of data that's been made available by agencies like NOAA that provide APIs to create a whole ecosystem of applications in uh, the weather. But when we think about healthcare, there's actually, of course, missing opportunities in terms of the data, the APIs to that information, and then the suite of applications and apps that allow us to really understand what's happening at the population level. And my, um, you know, you'd think, okay, well, there's a huge amount of data that's being generated, and of course there really is, so we're not missing that information, all the streams of information, genotype information, phenotype, real-world data, but all of that information is incredibly siloed. It's not really in, in any connected way. It's not, there's no unique patient identifier. It's really difficult to get this across institutions. Now, my background is actually in geographic information systems, and it's a really good analogy because when we think about the data layers that we use to build the GIS, what we see in Google Maps, land use, transportation, infrastructure, the common unit of analysis, of course, is the latitude-longitude, which allows us to get characteristics of that particular location across those layers. When we think about this from a patient information commons, it, it essentially is the same thing, where the unit, of course, is the patient. It's not actually the location or geography, although I'll talk about geography in a little bit. So the question is, how do we start to bring all these information streams together? It's a real challenge, but there's many initiatives and many, even at Harvard Medical School, that are trying to bring these data sets into one organized way. At Boston Children's, we're really thinking about this from the clear perspective of patient care. The idea of precision medicine only works if we're integrating all the various streams of information that are critical to the care of patients. At our hospital, of course, we think about rare diseases, uh, uh, unknown um, diseases of genetic origin. And the only way that we can actually take down the life cycle of taking a diagnosis all the way to treatment is integrating all these data sources. So the idea is, of course, patient phenotype. So we need to do deep patient phenotyping, identifying real-world in information about those patients to the point so then we're obviously doing gen genomic, inf collecting genomic inter information, interpretation of that data, all to eventually organize that information to then identify causative mutations, develop mouse models, with the hope, the hope, and this doesn't work in every case, but the hope that we could create a, a end of one product for that one condition that we've identified. So that is what we're trying to aim for. All those data elements are there, but the idea is how do we start to integrate that information. We're doing this in different parts of the hospital as well. So think about radiology. We collect massive amounts of radiological images, tens of thousands every day that radiologists have to interpret. And we've heard this as an analogy. Many startups are in this space, path.ai. Um, the idea is we could start to understand the data and start to build algorithms to organize this information so that we can do actual real-time identification of patterns. So we have a collaboration with GE right now, and the idea is that we're creating this base level of data that's normal and not normal information that allows us to essentially come up with a way to improve the process of, of the radiologist. But even more importantly, the idea is we can take our knowledge and expertise and build that into software and tools that then can be expanded across the world. Of course, there's other examples. So in the ICU, massive amounts of data is being generated from vital sign information, from a mechanical ventilators. We're not using that data in any real effective way. But if you think about it, if we start to build uh, predictive models based on that data, those forecasts can actually help do a variety of things. 
They can help identify early in,、um, issues around ventilator associated conditions. They can do continuous assessment, so we can actually look at things like whether it's time to extubate a patient, which can obviously lead to、uh, improved patient outcomes. And then finally, actually predicting length of stay of a patient. It, in, at our hospital, the reality is that length of stay. Can really cut down costs in massive ways, but it, we're not utilizing the data to actually help us with that. So this is one example. This is data from a, a blood pressure and oxygen intake. We can start to utilize the, the, the rapid amount of data that's being collected every four seconds to make predictions of, of the likelihood of, of, of an outcome of a patient. But we can do this days ahead from when, a, for instance, a patient, I mean, a physician is actually looking at this data and can actually read the information properly. We can also use data from outcomes of interaction with the emergency department. So、um, this is a paper actually from a colleague, Ben Rice, who is looking at data of people presenting into the emergency department with specific outcomes: injuries,、um, urinary tract infections, things that actually might be indicators of abuse. But it takes high flyers and multiple interactions in the emergency department before we actually identify someone who's actually、uh, been abused and, and in a domestic abuse situation. If we start to utilize the data, we can actually make predictions of that patient well before they actually ever get that diagnosis to actually cut down that time before that person is identified.、Um, even from that per perspective, using the data that's actually being utilized,、um, we can actually think about、um, how we can identify whether a patient would be admitted to the hospital. So, a patient presents with symptoms; it takes hours before we even identify whether that patient could be admitted to the hospital. With data that we have historically, we can identify certain types of outcomes that actually lead to predictions that we can actually start the process of identifying a bed for that patient and cut down the time for them waiting in, in, in the ED. Okay, so this is all well and good, but the reality is that we don't have an infrastructure to take all our know-how, all our applications, all our tools, and then extend them out there. We've seen really good examples to the financial industry where there is. Like for instance, applications like Stripe that allow for a much more continuous ability for merchants to interact with credit card companies. We, we want to create that abstraction layer in healthcare, but that really hasn't come into play. So we're thinking about this. There's new standards. People in the room might be familiar with Fire,、uh, a smart app gallery. There's new、uh, technologies that are being made available to develop apps that exist on top of the EMR, but are not one. End of one app, so they don't just exist on our EMR, but they can be extended to many other EMRs in other settings. And of course, our、uh, group is actually focused on new innovations on top of the EMR, so different applications like blood pressure、uh, centiles, like decision support tools, things that not only will affect patient lives in our hospital, but can be extended into other platforms. Okay, so a lot of what I've spoken so far has to do with the idea that there's. You know, clinical care and the data that comes from the, the interaction with the patient. But as we know, that context、um, only a small proportion of risk and outcomes is related to someone's biology and actually their genetics. We know that their circumstances, their location, their, their behavior is what really drives most of outcomes. But that data isn't actually captured in the course of care. So how do we start to do that? Well. At Boston Children's, we're really thinking about this from the perspective of the patient journey. The patient journey isn't just about their interaction with the healthcare system. That's only a small fraction of what they actually interact with. We, in terms of health data, in terms of the generation of information, we know that there's many other steps that exist before they ever get to the institution, and many steps after they leave. So the question is, how do we start tapping into those kind of data that are very different? So. We developed a concept called the digital phenotype. It's this idea, and, and Daniel made some really great mention of this, which is this idea that all the data that we generate for, with our interaction of technologies, our wearables, what we are actually tweeting about here today, our searches on Google, all that information can have incredible sort of、uh, deep insight into our health behaviors and into our outcomes. So. My background is in infectious disease, so for instance, we can get amazing insights about food poisoning in populations. You have no idea how many people, millions of people, tweet about their diarrhea every year. We get insights about chronic disease and people talking about outcomes like sleep deprivation. We get issues around drug safety, so we built the social media mining system for the FDA based on just the patient voice online, a whole new data set. And then behaviors that you would never get through any clinical context, and I'll tell you just in, in, a, in a little bit about our work in drug diversion and abuse. And then finally,、um, we we spend a huge amount of time collecting very expensive surveys on patient experience, and so 
there's new ways of actually getting insights on how patients are, are, are perceiving their own care. So just to give you a couple examples, so this, of course, is a huge amount of information that's being generated through all these interactions with technologies, with, with our likes on Facebook, our searches on Google. But we, if we build taxonomies to organize that information, we can actually get incredible new insights about individuals, but more importantly, get massive insights at the population level, which I'll tell you about in a second. But at the same time, actually get new insights at a global scale. The data that we're collecting is not sort of in the same vein as an EMR that's locked down, but it's actually available in real time globally. So a couple examples. Um, this is Health Map. This is actually the weather, uh, the weather map for disease that we created about 10 years ago with funding from Google with the idea that we can actually create a living, breathing, real-time map of disease events that are happening around the world in real time and, and actually provide that information back to government agencies. This kind of information, so tapping into that data that exists online, can allow us, for instance, to identify diseases earlier in populations like H1N1, which identified uh, uh, it, uh, swine flu in Mexico days ahead of what's when CDC provided that information. And not only that, these data can provide global view of a, the movement of a virus that, that translocates around the world in real time. This is not something that any public health agency with standard data collection me uh, mechanisms can do. Um, I'm sure people here are familiar with Google Flu Trends, with a lot of bit of controversy around the use of search query data. It was, though, fundamental in terms of a shift in understanding the value of search query data. What we search for online is an indication of our health behaviors and outcomes. And if we start tapping into that data, it can actually be incredibly valuable. So for instance, data from not only Google, but Wikipedia. So the number of times I go to the Wikipedia page for flu, also an indicator of, of influence on the population. Table reservations, um, you didn't know this, open table cancellations, also an indicator of flu in a population. So data that you would never have thought about. Um, but even more importantly, you can start t tapping into places that are very data poor, like for instance, the emergence of Ebola across West Africa provided us incredible insights about what was taking place across the region, but then also provided us this global view of how we would expect the movement of the virus globally based on the interaction with uh, transportation networks. And of course, can't mention infectious disease without mentioning Zika. Of course, we were able to, to use this data to actually show the, the global movement and across the Americas of this emerging virus and actually develop predictive tools based on the intersection of, of mosquito populations to come up with ways to predict where we'd see cases next. Probably everybody here uses Yelp. You probably didn't know 10% of all Yelp reviews are food poisoning related. Um, and incredible that the, the consumer is actually incredibly smart in identifying the, the ingredients that are, influ that are part of their disease at, to the level that's are almost stunningly correlated with CDC data. And from that perspective, we've developed tools to actually directly engage back with people so we can actually re-engage re -engage someone who just tweeted about diarrhea and actually asked them to help, and then we can actually send food inspectors to, to look at the restaurant where they just were. This is data with our collaboration with Google post-Hurricane Harvey, where we were able to show that we can actually start to look at, at diarrheal events post the hurricane, as we expect, of course, water quality and other issues to emerge. Okay, Instagram. I'm sure many Instagram users here. Um, you probably don't Instagram these kinds of things. Um, people, Instagram is a platform that in plain sight is talking about abuse and diversion of medications. Um, some, some examples here. We built a site that actually tracked the black market value of, of prescription drugs based on what people are reporting on the street. We actually have detailed data on black market price fluctuations. And before you become horrified by this data, the point is, of course, and it's used by government agencies to understand the real world impact of new products, a new product, a new formulation of OxyContin drops in price because it's not as, 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 as interesting to abusers because you can't extract the active ingredient from it. There's all sorts of new data that we can start tapping into. I'll go quickly as I'm running out of time here. We think about new ways to engage with consumers. We develop tools that take our evidence-based guidelines and tools from the clinic, but bring them to consumers in all sorts of ways. Uh, of course, Daniel mentioned things like devices and connected wearables. We're actually building our decision support tools in across these wearable technologies to actually influence decision-making on the part of the consumer. Um, and of course, Alexa, and it's been mentioned a couple times already, we actually created the first healthcare scale for Amazon Alexa called KidsMD. Um, and that is actually a way to inter inter um, interact with parents about a top acute conditions. This also is a new opportunity to collect data uh, from the ground. 
The last part of the talk I'll just mention is that these large data sets not only can influence our understanding of population health, but they can also influence the access to care. So we built a, a site with uh, Google actually many years ago called Vaccine Finder, where we have data on every pharmacy, every location that provides life-saving vaccines to communities. Despite that, you can't have someone walk a block and get a flu shot. We thought to ourselves, well, why not bring the flu shot to the people? And so we actually reached out to Uber a few years ago with this idea, how do you get someone to, to get a vaccine if it's on demand? And so we built, um, we somehow convinced legal to put the Uber health button on, on uh, the Uber app, which, trust me, putting vaccine, uh, needles, syringes in Uber cars and getting someone to agree to that was not easy. Um, but somehow we did it. And we actually were able to act, get nurses in cars and develop on, uh, an on-demand structure so that people who never got the flu shot or many who had not gotten the flu shot the year before were now getting the flu shot. And this is a core part of the population that just doesn't think about the flu shot. And of course, as you can imagine, on-demand nature is so critical to people. It's such, a, it's such an important part of their decision making. So we're thinking now, like, how do we start to go bigger? And of course, companies like Lyft, Uber, Amazon are all getting into this space. There's a whole ecosystem of companies that are touching the on-demand world. Um, we're thinking about this as well. We launched a company called Circulation out of Boston Children's that is all about dealing with patient logistics. So we recognize that care is not just about what you receive in the hospital, but also the, the barriers to access, which of course one of those areas is transportation. So we developed essentially a, a transportation exchange that connects patients with transportation options to essentially help bring efficiency to the healthcare system. And you can imagine, by bringing on-demand, you're reducing costs, you're upping patient satisfaction, you're reducing no-share rates, so the overall cost of the system starts to reduce. And this is just one example of a world that you can imagine that is actually going to be transformed with on-demand. Many opportunities, of course, the patient logistics being one, but of course, we're hearing so much around product logistics and pre prescriptions, caregiver logistics, and then even in an emergency scenario, you can imagine that a in a pandemic, you don't want people roaming around the streets. The idea that you can bring an antiviral to a patient is so, so important. So I'll just end here with just some of the challenges. And in fact, John Madison and I have a, a session tomorrow where we're going to do a panel and get drill, drill really into some of these issues more uh, concretely. I know this was a lot of information, almost a Daniel Kraft style speed, but maybe not quite. Um, so uh, you know, obviously, some of the key issues that you can imagine, access, storage of this data, especially as researchers, how do we start to get, gather and integrate these data sets? It's such a burgeoning field. There's so much opportunity, but still a lot of obstacles along the way. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Amazing tour de force. I can lessen on speaking even faster. <laughs> um, so one question, what surprised you, even to make something relatively simple like Amazon Echo, yeah. what surprised you about how that was used or not used? And what are the barriers yeah. to getting that integrated into systems? Right, I mean, the Echo is still, um I mean, there's so much opportunity in voice-first applications. We are taking a text-based tool and trying to make it voice-related, and you really can't have that sort of thinking. You need to sort of start with voice and build it from the ground up, and that we sort of made that mistake. Obviously, the big sort of elephant in the room is HIPAA, so we're waiting for, for and it's going to happen, but uh, once that happens, the, the, the opportunities in, in Alexa, especially in the healthcare setting, are going to be uh, incredible. Right. Yeah. Incredible work. Thanks, John. Thanks so much. All right.